Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, glad to be uh, back at uh, THI and talking about some of the guidelines. Now, the topic that I've been given is the 2023 ACC AHA guidelines for the management of patients with CCD. These are uh, my uh, sources of research support as well as other disclosures. Now, as you know, a uh, guideline is really a, a business that takes a very long time and needs a lot of people. So uh, this is a guideline that was published in the later half of 2023. I had the pleasure of working with uh, my vice chair, uh, Dr. Kristen Newby, and 25 other AHA ACC volunteers, including volunteers from four other organizations who took part in the development of the guidelines, but the guideline itself was endorsed by five other societies that are listed on the right-hand side of the slide. Now, as you can imagine, uh, it would be very difficult to summarize the entire guideline in 10 minutes, and I'm not going to try to even attempt that. I'm just giving you an outline of what is out there in the guideline. If you decide to go and read, there's also an accompanying slide set that summarizes all the recommendations, and in some cases, the evidence behind those recommendations as well. So if you look at the sections, you have take, take, uh, top 10 uh, take-home messages, which I will talk about in the next few slides. Uh, we have an introduction where we talk about methodology of the guideline. There's a section on epidemiology. There is a section then on evaluation, diagnosis, and risk stratification for chronic coronary disease. And then there's a treatment section that has three large subsections. As you can see, we have general approach to treatment. We have uh, guideline-directed management and therapy, where you'll see all the various classes of medications and risk factors that need to be managed, and then therapies to prevent CV events. And there you have some of the common ones and some of the uncommon ones. We have a section on revascularization, which is an abridged version, taking some recommendations from the REVAS guidelines, talking about PCI, as well as PCI versus cabbage, and what are some of the principles for REVAS in patients with CCD, then there's a section on special populations, SCAD, ANOCA, heart failure, valvular heart disease, if they are concomitant with CCD, young adults, women, patients with cancer, older adults. And then we have some recommendations on follow-up and monitoring, and then other considerations, whether those are cost and value, as well as what are the evidence uh, gaps in research needs. Now, some of the sections also talk about environmental exposures. You know, What do you do with PM 2.5 levels and, and in CCD patients? What do you do with extreme heat exposure, noise exposure? So I really would recommend you read this guideline because I am going to really skim over some of the recommendations. Before I do that, it's important to understand what is the definition of chronic coronary disease. And remember, the word is chronic coronary disease, not co chronic coronary artery disease, because you can have coronary disease in the microvascular bed as well. It doesn't have to be the arterial bed. So these are patients who have history of ACS or coronary revascularization who are stabilized and now they have chronic coronary disease, which I will refer to CCD going forward. Patients who have systolic dysfunction in the setting of coronary artery disease. Patients who have stable angina symptoms or angina equivalence, where a treating clinician assumes or has made the decision that this is related to coronary disease, that they actually have those symptoms and angina symptoms and evidence of coronary vasospasm or microvascular disease. There are sections on just microvascular disease, which I would encourage you to read. And CCD, that's fine on screen exam. For example, coronary imaging, you do a stress test on someone, you do a CTA on someone, and that patient is found to have uh, uh, coronary, coronary, coronary disease, and you make a decision as the treating clinician that this is related to chronic coronary disease. So it's, again, a lot of this is left to the discretion of the treating clinician. So let's talk about the 10 messages that I believe are important and then try to summarize those towards the end as well. So the first message is that emphasize team-based patient-centered care that considers social determinants of health along with associated costs while incorporating shared decision-making and risk assessment, testing, and the use of therapies. Now, I put this slide here because patients with chronic coronary disease, just like heart failure patients that you just heard, are very complex patients. They require a lot of clinicians to work together. So physicians are only one aspect of it. You have dietitians, you have nurses, you have your advanced nurse practitioners, physician assistants, social workers, because we have a lot of social determinants of health that need to be taken care of. 
In fact, there is a lot of data that when you look at intermediate risk factor control like hypertension, diabetes, lipid management, quality of life, it is much better when you use a team-based approach compared to an approach where it's physicians only who are taking care of the patient. So I would highly, highly recommend that you leverage the entire care team when you are taking care of these patients. Second message is related to healthy diet and exercise is recommended for all patients with chronic coronary disease. Now, you know, we use a lot of therapies, whether that's antiplatelets, statin therapy, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors. There's data that when we have good lifestyle, whether that's good diet and or exercise, it leads to a multiplicative effect as far as the patient is concerned. So medications are important, yes, but when patients also have good lifestyle, those medications lead to even more beneficial effects for the patients. So I'm not going to read this. You have this slide in front of you, and this is taken directly from the guideline document as to what patients should choose instead of other diets and what they should avoid, for example, uh, trans fats. And again, we have some foods listed there which have trans fats. And then there are recommendations re re regarding dietary sodium, saturated fat, and how we should take care of it. So nutrition and physical activity remain extremely important. So the third message is habitual physical activity, reducing sitting time, and increasing aerobic and resistance exercise is extremely important. So is cardiac rehab. So we know that resistance training two days a week, and that's what the recommendation, the guideline is, improves a lot of these intermediate risk factors and quality of life. We have a class one recommendation for aerobic exercise, 150 minutes of uh, uh, a moderate intensity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise. And we know that the association between physical activity, remember I'm using the word physical activity and not exercise because it's really the physical activity that, that really makes a difference. And we have no recommendations now of bouts of 10 minutes or more. It's the cumulative physical activity. The association is mostly curvilinear, except in heart failure patients where it may be linear. And we see that up to 150 minutes, it's very, very steep. And even then you continue to have benefits up to 300 minutes, and then perhaps it stabilizes. So it's extremely important that even in that zero to 150 minute uh, uh, block, we ask our patients to increase physical activity and reduce sitting time as much as possible because the benefit is cumulative. It's benefit that is based on the total amount of physical activity and reducing sitting time and reducing physical inactivity is as important as increasing physical activity. So that's important for our patients. Again, we discussed SGLT2. We're going to discuss GLP-1 receptor agonists in the next uh, presentation. So I'm not going to dwell too much into it, but as we all know as clinicians, that these are extremely important medications in patients with CCD. And in fact, now in patients with CCD who may not even have diabetes, but have heart failure. And we saw data in both uh, patients with reduced ejection fraction, uh, preserved ejection fraction, and mid-range ejection fraction that Dr. Boscar just presented. So extremely important that we use these uh, medications. And as you all know, some of the earlier trials of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists were actually performed in patients who had established ASCVD, including patients with CCD. And now we're moving more and more towards these medications and their trials being performed in patients, even in primary or high-risk primary prevention setting. So I will leave that for the next presentation in terms of GLP-1 receptor agonist. You already heard a lot about SGLT2s. There are some recommendations related to beta blockers that if there is been one year after MI in a patient and the patient does not have any other pressing indication like uncontrolled hypertension or arrhythmia or uh, uh, LVEF that's less than 50%, then perhaps we should reassess the need for beta blocker. And in patients who don't have any prior MI or LVEF less than 50%, beta blocker is not recommended in the absence of any other primary indications. So we should reevaluate the need for beta blocker if we don't have these other indications for beta blockers in patients with CCD. Our uh, uh, message number six pertains to statin therapy and other non-statin therapy. We have ezetimibe now, PCSK9 inhibitors. We have inclisiran and bampidoic acid. And we have a triglyceride lowering medication called icosapent ethyl 
uh, based on reduced trial, and all of these could be used. The basic message here is that statins are first line. If you have a patient who's very high risk in terms of multiple bad atherosclerosis or CCD plus other risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, uh, heart failure, older age in those patients, after maximizing statin therapy, stepwise addition of ezetimibe followed by PCSK9 inhibitors is indicated. We can add bampidoic acid to that mix as well. It was a 2B recommendation in the guideline, but that was before clear outcomes came out. So you could also use bampidoic acid in those patients. And infliceran is an option in place of PCSK9 inhibitors where you don't have to give it every two weeks or every month. You can spread it out every three to six months. But of course, we do not have outcomes data on the use of infliceran. So statin therapy, ezetimibe, followed by PCSK9 inhibitors. You can add bampidoic acid as well. And if you want a large or a longer uh, dosing interval, you could use infliceran in place of PCSK9 inhibitors. Number seven, and again, I am not going to get into the details, but you should look at this figure that it's moving towards shorter and shorter duration of DAP therapy in patients with CCD, whether that's with or without the use of an oral anticoagulant. I would highly recommend you go and look at this section because you will see a lot of recommendations where we can cut down the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy and use just one antiplatelet agent. And in some patients who also require anticoagulant therapy, you will find more recommendations that will help you shorter the duration of DAP therapy, especially in patients who have a high bleeding risk. Number eight, again, and this is important because a lot of our patients are taking dietary supplements and non-prescription medications, including fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids, or vitamins. And these are not recommended. It's a class three recommendation because of lack of benefits. So these medications, we should talk to our patients and really make sure that they are only taking medications that have a proven benefit. These can have interactions with other medications. These lead to financial loss for our patients and really they don't provide any benefit. And the number ninth recommendation is routine periodic anatomic or ischemic testing. For example, doing annual echoes or annual stress tests is really not recommended without a change in clinical or function status for risk stratification or to guide therapeutic decision-making. So we should not be doing annual stress tests for annual echocardiograms on our patients because there is no evidence whatsoever that this strategy improves either functional class of our patients or decision-making that would improve uh, quality of life or will give our patients extra years of life. And number 10, is about e-cigarettes. There's a lot of data out there that e-cigarettes lead to higher quit rates compared to NRT, which is nicotine replacement therapy. But there is not long-term data on the use of e-cigarettes. And a lot of patients who end up taking e-cigarettes become long chronic users of e-cigarettes. Therefore, it is recommended as a 2B recommendation if one is to use e-cigarettes as a smoking cessation strategy. Better to go with counseling followed by nicotine replacement therapy, whether it's uh, you follow that up with bupropion or varenicline, which are, again, uh, 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 better agents in terms of smoking cessation, perhaps not to recommend e-cigarettes in patients as a smoking cessation tool. Now, there's a lot of uh, material there. There's a, a, a summary article that uh, a bunch of us wrote after the guideline was published. We talked about ABCs of chronic coronary disease. Again, A is to assess risk in these patients of recurrent events. Antiplatelet therapy, we talked about angina relief is important. We talked about B for beta blockers, blood pressure being the tar target being 150 over 80, assessing waist circumference and BMI. C is for cholesterol, communicating with the patients. We talked about cigarettes and, and tobacco products. D is for di di diet, diabetes, as well as depression. There's actually a section on, on, on mental health that uh, uh, we should assess mental health in patients with CCD. We talked about E, which is exercise and rehab. We discussed about that. And then F is for failure, which is heart failure and guideline directed uh, 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 strategies and, and, and therapies. And again, that's where we talked about the use of SGLT2 inhibitors. So again, with that, I'll stop. Uh, and the easier way to remember this is the secret to living well and longer is eat half, walk double, 
laugh triple and love without measure and with that i'll acknowledge uh, abhishek kami who's uh, helped with uh, some of these slides and hopefully we'll have some more discussion uh, at the end of this session so thank you for uh, the invitation <laughs>